The year is 1985. There's one toy that's about to hit the market that's going to completely revitalize a sector that's thought to be dead for at least two years. In less than one year from the release of this toy, that market will be back and better than ever. My name is Nate, and this is Dropout History, and today I'm going to explain to you how one robot saved an industry and an art form in North America. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video and explore your curiosity. I hope that you can learn something. With that being said, I'd like to say that I am not a credible source of information. I'm a college dropout who's done a little bit of research, and I'm stringing together a narrative about something that I like. I hope this can be a good starting point for you to start your pursuit of knowledge, but I am not an expert. Thanks for listening. I really hope you enjoy the video. Now, if you don't recognize this adorable little automaton, then let me introduce you. Its name is Rob, and that rectangular face and plastic eyes helped propel Nintendo to being the powerhouse that it is today and being a household name in America. Yes, that's right. Rob the Robot is a huge part of Nintendo's history. In short, Nintendo saved the home video game market in North America with the release of the NES. But it couldn't do it by itself and it certainly couldn't do it without standing on the shoulders of the giant that is Rob the Robot. Now, if you've been alive for any time within the last 35 years, that might sound like a really far-fetched idea. Why would the video game industry need saving? Well, from 1983 to 1985, just about anybody who's trying to make money would tell you that video games is not the way to do it. And at that time, they were completely right. The top dogs of the industry were getting a little bit too big for their britches and making a lot of really questionable decisions. The market bubble was ready to burst, and it did. Now, it's easy enough to just say that this market dropped, but what does that actually mean? So let's put it into perspective. During this two-year plummet that the market experienced, video game revenue dropped by 97%, going from $3.2 billion to $100 million. Video games that were once being sold for $30 to $40 were being picked out of bargain bins for $3 or $4. There was even a really famous rumor that Atari, the biggest name in the industry at the time, was burying unsold copies of games in landfills to get rid of them. That's a story for another time. But things weren't looking good when it came to selling video games. Of course, this wasn't the first time that the video game market took a hit up until that point, but we will touch on that a little bit later. But still, this is the biggest hit that it ever took, and people today still argue about why it happened. Now let's explore why that happened. When trying to understand how and why a market crashed, it's extremely helpful to know how a market came to be. Now let's get into my favorite part, the history. While the first interactive game with an electronic display was patented in 1948, the CRT, cathode ray tubes, amusement device, typically isn't considered the first video game because it wasn't ran on any kind of computing device. Additionally, it was never manufactured to a point beyond the prototype that was patented. In fact, it's speculated that it was only made to show off the commercial potential to DeMont Laboratories, a company that did a lot of development with cathode ray tubes. Even if it turns out that it has no real ties to anybody who's crucial to the development of the video game industry, I think it's unfair to not include the first interactive game with an electronic display into the history of video games. I think it's an important part of why the technology is where it is today. The first interactive games to fit the semantic parameters of a true video game were made on the computers of the days of yore in the 1950s. These games were made to test the capabilities of the computers and how human and computer interactions would work. In 1952, several really simple games such as Tic-Tac-Toe were being used to explore those interactions. Now up until this point in history, all the developments being made to get to the video games that we know and love were really being made strictly for research purposes. But in 1958, the first known video game was made for entertainment purposes. Tennis for Two was made on an oscilloscope. Tennis for Two was made in a Dumont lab using an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope, 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 oscilloscope. Oscilloscope, oscilloscope, oscilloscope. Oscilloscope. 
I have to look up how to fucking say this word. Oscilloscope. 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 These aren't helpful. Oscilloscope. 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 Tennis for Two was made on a Dumont Labs oscilloscope, which could simulate trajectory with wind resistance. As technology became more and more accessible to the people in the universities that these machines were being housed in, it only makes sense that more recreational uses are going to pop up. And by 1962, Space War was developed on the newly installed PDP-1 at MIT. The game became a hit in the small community of programmers and hackers. The code was even public domain, so it really wasn't that hard to get your hands on and for it to spread. And before too long, it became the first computer game to be available outside of one single research center. Throughout the rest of the 1960s, computers became more accessible, versatile, and affordable. So computer-related technologies began to grow at an unprecedented rate, including video games. In 1966, a man named Ralph Bayer came up with the idea of creating a home console that could play video games on a home television set. After working on it in secret while on the clock, he eventually showed it to his employers at Sanders Associates and got their support. After getting approval from his bosses, he went on to make several prototypes, the seventh one being dubbed the Brown Box. This brown box was shown to several manufacturers, and in 1971, Magnavox agreed to produce it. In 1972, the first home video game console, the Magnavox Odyssey, hit shelves. During that same time frame that the brown box was being developed, a man named Nolan Bushnell saw Space War at Stanford University, and then enlisted his co-worker, Ted Dabney, to help him make a coin-operated version of the game. By 1971, the two of them had developed Computer Space, the first coin-operated video game and birth and industry. Now it's time to backtrack a little bit. We're over here in video game history, and now I think it's relevant to take a little step over into arcade history. While typically we think of arcades and video games to be somewhat synonymous, that wasn't necessarily always the case. Today, arcades are a staple when we take a retrospective look back to the 1980s and their pop culture. In most media references to the 1980s, we see arcades and we see a place where kids could just go to hang out and that's okay. Prior to the 1960s, that kind of wasn't the perception on arcades. In short, a very simplified explanation is that in 1933, when pinball games were first introduced, they didn't have paddles like you would expect. Those came in 1947. It was strictly a game of chance, which a lot of people associated with gambling. So because of that, they gained this lasting reputation that arcades were seedy joints that were going to corrupt the youth of the day. It really was like that up until about 1969, when a person by the name of Jules Millman sought out to change that. They established a small arcade in the mall in Illinois where they had a very strict policy of no food, no drinks, and no smoking. And they had a very strong emphasis on having staff around all the time that would make sure that no strange business is going on. Now parents were all of a sudden actually comfortable leaving their children in arcades while they shopped and it caught on. Millman went on to open several more arcades that worked out really well. Eventually they were actually bought out by a pinball company that was called Bali. Of course, with any success, there's always going to be imitators, and before long, a bunch of other family-friendly arcades began to pop up. Arcades began to really cement their place in pop culture as a family-friendly place, and they'd be the perfect place to have video games in the near future. Um, uh... Oh, we're back in the 1970s. Now, in 1972, the Magnavox releases, and it actually doesn't have phenomenal sales. That same year, Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney decide to leave their jobs and form Atari. Bushnell saw a version of the Odyssey and decided to task one of his employees with making a version of the table tennis game. That employee got to work and made a working demo that wasn't quite finished, but everybody had so much fun with the demo, they decided to keep it that way, and that was the game. Pong was born, 
and after being given a very limited release in 1972, it quickly became a hit. By 1973, video games were in the spotlight, and it laid the foundations for the industry to flourish. Other games from both Atari and other startups were beginning to pop up, and the market began to materialize. One of the most notable games to come out of 1974 is the game Gunfight. It was made by Taito, the first Japanese company to break their way into the industry. And it was also the first game to use a microprocessor, which paved the way for new technologies in the industry as well. While other games were being introduced to the market, the Pong hype had definitely not died down. From 1975 to 1977, Pong ripoffs and clones were flooding the home video game market that was already extremely limited. With all the new advancements of microprocessors and microprocessors becoming more affordable, more consumer electronics that were actually powerful enough to play video games and weren't the size of arcade cabinets were becoming more of a possibility. In 1975, Magnavox discontinued the Odyssey and introduced the Odyssey 100, which completely ditched the plastic overlays that the Odyssey used. The Odyssey 100 just kind of trimmed the fat of the Odyssey and cut the 28 games down to two, which were hockey and tennis which were very similar to Pong. Within that time frame of 1975 to 1977, Magnavox have released nine different upgrades and updates to the Odyssey series, and pretty much all of them were just different Pong machines. Hello. During the editing of this video and going through the footage, I found out that I lost some footage. So, please join me in my car and I will teach you. During this time frame that Magnavox had released their nine different Pong machines, they weren't the only ones doing it. After several bumps in the road, Atari finally hopped into the game with the help of Sears. Now, Atari of course was responsible for the arcade Pong game, but they hadn't hit the home market yet, and Sears helped them do it by releasing the telegames. And then later, Atari released a version under their own name in 1976. This was also the emergence of the toy company Coleco hopping into the video game market. And that same year in 1976, about a dozen others did too. From 1975 to 1977, this whole time period where Pong was the reigning champion, video game sales were booming, increasing by 1600%. But unsurprisingly, that kind of growth can't be maintained, and eventually it came crumbling down. By 1977, the US had been completely Ponged out. 1978 typically marks the start of the golden age of video games, specifically arcade video games, not just in the US, globally. However, we are going to focus pretty much entirely on the American market. One of the next big video game release milestones actually has some pretty interesting trivia tied to it, and some might say that it's not really relevant to the history, but I think it kind of is. Now let's explore the story of a very smelly businessman that you actually have most likely heard of. And I think if nothing else aside from entertainment value, it'll hopefully provide some perspective as to why microprocessors are a really important thing. Well, we're still on my car. We haven't quite caught up to where my footage cut out, but I think I have a solution that will make everybody happy. Now, I know it can be jarring to jump from one setting to the other, so that's why I have enlisted the help of science. Using the latest technology, we're able to simulate as if we were still in my office and we hadn't lost any footage at all. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna patch us back to our experimental simulation. During all this time that all the little businessmen were making their Pong ripoffs, arcade video games didn't just stop existing. In fact, they were getting more and more advanced in this time period. Microprocessor chips are getting better and better, and in fact, that's why we're able to get them into the consumer electronics. And if we're able to make them even better and more powerful, we can use even less of them in consumer electronics and make even more money when we try to sell them. This little Pong machine, one chip. This arcade cabinet, about a hundred. Atari had to buy these chips for about $12 a piece, so if you can make a game run on fewer of them, you're making a lot more money. In 1974, a very smelly and pretentious man began working at Atari. He got along pretty poorly with the rest of the employees, and by many accounts, he wasn't really that good at his job. But Nolan Bushnell saw potential in him. Or, at least he saw the potential in his good friend that would often come into the office and help him with his work. This smelly man and his friend was none other than Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who would later found Apple. Now, Bushnell was only paying Jobs, who was his employee, but he was getting the talent of Wozniak, who was an engineer at HP, for no extra charge. So one day, this happened. Steve, we need our games to use less chips so we can make more money. 
Okay. If you can make this game break out, use less chips, I'll give you more money. Okay. Now, Nolan Bushnell offered Steve Jobs $700 just to do it at all. And he told him he'd pay him an additional $100 for every chip that he could take out of the design. Now, Steve Jobs accepted and, of course, enlisted the help of Steve Wozniak. He offered to split the pay of $700 right down the middle and told him that they had to make it in under 50 chips, which wasn't really what the deal was. And on top of that, he didn't even mention that there was a bonus for making it with less chips. About four days later, Steve Wozniak presented a version of the game that used only about 44 to maybe 46 chips. Jobs gave him the $350 as he promised and then kept the $5,000 bonus that he received and never told him. Steve Wozniak didn't even find out until years later when Nolan Bushnell asked him what he did with the money. Atari didn't end up using the design that Steve Wozniak used because they claimed it was too difficult to manufacture, but it's still an interesting look into how much of a dick Steve Jobs was. With all these changes, Space Invaders was made. In June of 1978, it was released in Japan, and before long, entire arcades, arcades that were dedicated to playing Space, Space Invaders, Invaders were popping up. By July of that same year, it hit America. And though it didn't have the same commercial dominance that it did in Japan, the combined success of that and Atari's Asteroids was enough to push Pinball off of the throne of the arcade. Not to mention all the other places that were now housing arcade games. The most popular games for the next few years were all about shooting things or involved some kind of warfare. But the introduction of one of my favorite characters brought new diversity to the gameplay as well as the demographics of people that were in video game arcades. Pac-Man hit the scene in 1980 and took the arcades by storm. Ah, oh, shit. Most of the arcades prior to Pac-Man's release appealed to younger boys and not much else, but Pac-Man was developed with the intention of bringing in a more diverse customer base, and it really worked. Now, not just young boys, but everybody was playing. Even businessmen would take their lunch breaks off and play Pac-Man in the arcade. Now, for the first time in video game history, video games had a face, a mascot of sorts, and it was Pac-Man. Before long, there was Pac-Man merchandise of all kinds, and Pac-Man became a household name. Even to this day, Pac-Man is one of the most recognizable characters of all age groups. Following Pac-Man, many more games that were alternative gameplay to shooters were beginning to pop up, like Miss Pac-Man, Qbert, and Donkey Kong. And Donkey Kong was even one of the first platform games even made. It was certainly the first platformer to see commercial success, and it was the first big hit for Nintendo in North America. During this period, the video game industry was absolutely booming. Sales went from about 800 million in 1978 to 9 billion in 1982. Though the home market stayed kind of stuck in one place from 1975 to 1977, this time frame was a time of growth for all sectors of the video game market but it definitely was not perfect by any means. So today, when we think of retro video games, game cartridges in their many shapes and sizes are practically synonymous with retro video games, but they weren't necessarily there from day one, or at least not in the way that we are most familiar with them. I think this is Most video game consoles and their cartridges, or whatever other use of data storage that they use, work in this way. The programming of the game is in the cartridge. The console is really just a computer or some kind of vessel that runs these programs that are on the cartridges. The console is just a computer to run the code. The Magnavox Odyssey wasn't quite like that. It essentially had all of the playable games programmed into the system, and the cartridges that it used would essentially just route the circuits to the correct game that you were trying to play. So then, during this age of Pong, most of these game consoles were just being designed to play one game. These systems and the original Magnavox Odyssey were considered to be the first generation of consoles. Now, in 1976, Fairchild released their console, the Channel F, 
that console introduced ROM cartridges, which are what we recognize today as most video game cartridges. So Fairchild, prior to the release of this, had lost a lot of money selling digital watches, and so they weren't really in the best position to be taking a huge gamble. They didn't put all their eggs in one basket and kept the production for the Channel F at a pretty low number. In 1977, there was what can be considered a crash in the home video game market, but interest in video games didn't decline. It was interest in Pong. But the problem was that the entire first generation of consoles were essentially Pong machines. So the Fairchild Channel F is really the start of the second generation, and it was followed up by Atari with their 2600. Basically, in 1977, a lot of retailers were really hesitant to be taking on video games because the sales had been really lackluster after the fall of Pong. This was one of the factors that caused the parent company of Atari to let go of Nolan Bushnell. Although, some sources say that he left because of disagreements on his own accord. The following years would contain a lot of very questionable decisions made by Atari, and a lot of those would contribute to the video game crash of 1983. Now, in 1978, Magnavox came back with the Magnavox Odyssey 2, and in 1979, Mattel, the company that's responsible for Barbie, hit the market with the Intellivision. The holiday season in 1978 was a pretty profitable one, and it helped convince a lot of retailers to stock video games in 1979. Two consecutive years of good sales and growth was enough to give Atari the confidence to try a new market strategy. Now instead of marketing as just a cool toy that you could buy your kids on the holidays, Atari was trying to become a year-round profitable business. At this point, if a video game company was releasing a game, they were likely making the games themselves. This is what's called a first-party developer. Think about how Nintendo makes a lot of their games, like Mario, for their system. Well, before 1979, that's how all video games were made. If you were going to make a console, then you better be able to make the games for it. Now, in 1979, a group of programmers that worked at Atari decided that they were tired of not getting credit for making the games that they were making. Programmers just didn't get the same recognition that they do today. In fact, the first easter egg in the game was in the game Adventure, and it's because a programmer hid his name in the game for people to find. More importantly though, these creators weren't getting royalties for the games that they were making. They were being paid to program the games, and then that was that. I'm sure you can imagine how that could be a really shitty deal if your game becomes really popular and you just are getting paid what you're paid either way. Now eventually, a bunch of these programmers just got fed up and decided to leave Atari and start their own company. That company would be the first third-party developer developing games for other companies. And that company would become the company that we know today as Activision. In 1980, home versions of a lot of popular arcade games were being made, and Atari's sale numbers practically doubled. Activision soon hit the scene and didn't pull their punches. In 1981 and 1982, they released hit after hit. A lot of those games that were being released would become the foundation to a lot of other really popular games to come. Activision clearly also had a big impact on the market because programmers from both Atari and Mattel left to make their own company, Imagic. Now reaching the end of the second generation of consoles, Atari released the 5200 in order to compete with Intellivision. But it just didn't really have many titles and had pretty limited sales. Around that same time, Coleco released the ColecoVision, which just dominated the holiday market of 1982 because of their port of Donkey Kong. The 5200 had pretty poor sales, and in a few years it was completely discontinued. And though Coleco had great sales by the end of 1982, it would be the last good season for about three years. And now, a word from our sponsor. Ah. Diego! Yeah? Care to explain this? 
Now we've all been in that situation before. But with this new Miracle product, those interactions are a thing of the past. With just three easy steps, you too can find yourself in a world with no responsibility. Step one, panic. Step two, apply a healthy amount of our patented formula. And step three, chair. But hey, don't take my word for it. Hear what these happy customers have to say. Yeah, I tried it. Turn my girlfriend Josie into a chair. I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, like at first it was like really cool because I was, you know, like a chair. But then I got termites in my arm. Yeah, I heard about it. Cousin Lenny, he was a riot. Now, I use him for kindling. Yar, he left me a man down a leg. Dr. Baum was a grad student of mine, and his advances in the cream community have proven valuable for families across the country, really. It doesn't get much better than that. Don't miss your chance to call the number below to get your helping of Dr. Baum's Magic Chair Cream. Wow, wonderful stuff. Okay, so now we should have a solid understanding about how the market got to the point that it was up until 1982. The key takeaway should be that the market's really unstable and is very dependent on the next fad or the next big thing. And through all that, the one company that seems to remain on top for most of it is Atari. So what happened in 1983? Now, for a lot of people who just know the pop culture of video games, then it's kind of general knowledge that there were just two really bad games that kind of just destroyed the market. Right? <laughs> Wrong! While this very dramatic and simple explanation kind of makes a good story, it's not really true. Now the two games in question are E.T. and the home version of Pac-Man developed for the Atari. They're a topic that's worthy for their own video essay entirely, so for now I'm just going to kind of explain that they weren't the sole reason that the market crashed. They definitely didn't help, but they didn't make it just topple. Alright, let's get into why this market crashed. It's often said that in the 1980s, there were just too many video game consoles, that the just flood of new consoles was just hurting the market. While there were a lot of video game consoles at the time, much like today, there was a handful of companies that were really the superpowers of the market. For most of that period, Atari, Mattel, and Magnavox were really the only real competition. And through that, Atari was always on top. Plus, if you remember from earlier in this video, even these really big companies were having a really hard time getting retailers to stock their products. If the company that's synonymous with that era of home video games can't even stock their products, how can these other smaller companies even take any kind of significant chunk out of the market? Another theory is that the rise of computer gamings was another nail in the coffin for home video games. Think about it. Why would you buy a machine that can only play video games when you could play a computer that doubles as a video game machine and a personal computer? While this may have been a factor, I don't think that was the case for the vast majority of consumers. The personal computer and computer gaming have their own story that is completely separate from video games, and they just happen to have their own upsurgence just as video games were falling, and they're not really correlated. or at least not in the same way that personal computers were. From 1977 until the crash, most of the hardware that was being released for video games was either purely cosmetic, or it just wasn't being supported by new releases to properly stimulate the market. Lastly, people often state that the emergence and abundance of all these third-party developers helped kill the industry. Now this one to me actually has a little bit of truth to it, and it actually ties into our two mythical bad video games. Why did these third-party developers even start coming about? because Atari and other companies got greedy and wouldn't pay their devs fairly. 
next thing you know, we have a lot of talented developers who can make their own games and make their own money. And now that companies can make their own games to sell to other companies to sell, we see a lot of really not great games. And while that's not the biggest factor, it certainly doesn't help the confidence of the consumers. Now let's get into the famed industry killers, Pac-Man and E.T. So basically in 1982, Atari did what they had to do and paid who they had to pay to make sure that they were the ones who were making the home version of Pac-Man. They knew there was a lot of money to be made there because remember, everybody loved Pac-Man. They had a game that was developed that was kind of Pac-Man-esque, but it wasn't quite Pac-Man. It was very different than the very beloved Pac-Man arcade game. Now again, if we think back to the situation about Breakout, then we know that arcades use a lot of microprocessor chips. And though home consoles had advanced a lot from 1976 to 1982, they still weren't powerful enough to emulate arcades in the same way that we can today. Though we can look back retroactively at this port of Pac-Man and say that it's kind of bad, some people will argue, and I don't really know which is true, that some people liked it. And I like to think that consumers were smart enough to realize that they weren't getting the arcade version of Pac-Man, so maybe a lot of them didn't feel cheated. Again, that gets debated. But either way, one thing that is entirely true is Atari was way too overconfident with this. In 1982, there were about 10 million Atari consoles that were in American homes. But they produced... 12 million copies of this game. Atari was so confident that they thought that Pac-Man was going to be a system seller. So they made way more copies than they could possibly sell. Now, let's talk about E.T. The movie E.T. was released in June of 1982. It was a smash hit and is still fondly remembered as a piece of pop culture. Also in 1982, much like with Pac-Man, Atari spent a ridiculous amount of money to get the rights to make the E.T. game. Again, being very confident that they could make a whole lot of money with this game. Atari tasked the poor programmer Howard Stark... Stark, that's fucking from Marvel. Howard Scott Warshaw. Atari tasked the poor programmer Howard Scott Warshaw to make the game in a ridiculous amount of time. For context, the Pac-Man arcade game was in development for a year and five months. And while all video games, especially arcade games and home video games, don't take the same amount of time to create, that should give some insight on how long it takes to craft a quality game. Now, for Atari to be able to have this game out by the holiday season of 1982, which is the most profitable time for a video game, they had to have everything done. That means development, manufacturing, advertising, completed in six short weeks. Long story short, it got done, but it was a complete flop. Many parents were even returning the game back to the stores that they bought them from. And now that sounds pretty bad because it is, but it gets worse. This should also explain why Pac-Man was such a financial hit, even if it did sell well. And now it's time to learn about economics. Basically, when we think of selling things in retail, we think of things in wholesale. Someone makes a product and then sells it to a store at a wholesale price. Then the store sells it at a higher price and makes profit. Once the store has the product, the supplier is completely out of the story. If the retailer can't sell all the product, then they have to figure out how they're going to handle that. And because of that, retailers tend to buy in numbers that they can confidently sell. So that way they have a very minimum loss. Now during these early days of video games, retailers were not enthused to be selling video games. They didn't have a lot of confidence in them. And so because of that, they had a different deal. Typically, the supplier and the retailer would have some kind of deal where the retailer would let the supplier sell their items through them, but they wouldn't buy them at a wholesale price. They wouldn't buy them at all. In this way, they'd split their profits and it would be mutually beneficial. But it stops being mutually beneficial when the retailer puts all the burden of unsold stock back onto the supplier. When the video game supplier would get too confident, then the retailers would get gluttonous. They would have more games than they could possibly sell and that would go back to Atari or whoever else is making the games. And that is exactly what happened with these two games. Did they single-handedly kill Atari? No, but they did cost them hundreds of millions of dollars and probably deterred a lot of customers to not have any confidence in Atari anymore. And not to mention that even though these retailers weren't taking a big loss from these products, they weren't making any money. So what is the point of having it in their stores? So now our takeaway should be that bad video games didn't cause the market to crash but they did contribute. The real reason that the market tanked is why a lot of markets tanked. 
corporate greed and retail glut. Now that the stage is set and we understand how all this happened, we can get to the hero of our story. For the most part, we've been talking about the American video game market. But now at this point in history, it's important to look at the Japanese video game market. So let's go to Japan. Thank you for waiting. In 1983, Nintendo released the Family Computer, otherwise known as the Famicom. And with it were released ports of Donkey Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., and Popeye the Sailor. On that same day, Sega released their console, the SG-1000, which became a commercial failure. With next to no real competition in the entire country for Nintendo, by 1984, they completely had the whole market cornered. It became the best-selling system in Japan, and one in every four households had a Famicom. Now, with Nintendo being the unquestionable leader in the market in Japan, they were ready to tackle the next big thing. The world. Initially, they were negotiating with Atari to have Atari handle the North American distribution for Nintendo. But eventually, it just fell through. And with that, Nintendo would be on their own. But it wasn't all bad for Nintendo. The biggest name in video games in the world, Atari, had just been split into two different companies by their parent company. And now Atari was nowhere near the threat to Nintendo that they would have been otherwise. But despite having their possibly biggest competitor literally cut in half and still recovering from losing hundreds of millions of dollars, there were still no retailers who were willing to stock video games. The writing was on the wall that if Nintendo stood any kind of chance for breaking into this market, they had to do something different. They would need to have consumers think that they weren't just buying another video game console. And more importantly, they need to have retailers think that they weren't just stocking another video game console. With the rise in popularity of home computers, Nintendo took inspiration. Famicom got a complete makeover and looked a lot more futuristic and had a computer vibe to it. It even came with a keyboard and a tape drive for saving data. In early 1985, Nintendo unveiled their newly designed console, and it garnered a lot of attention and positive feedback in magazines. But when all was said and done, retailers saw right through it. Nintendo received no orders from retailers. Once again, it needed a redesign to disguise it even further. Instead of being a top loader where you plug a cartridge into the top of the machine, it was more like a VCR where you put the cartridge in and it was hidden from sight. This would be the final design for what became the Nintendo Entertainment System. But that's not all. In the 1980s, American culture was obsessed with the future, especially robots. Whether it was Transformers or Pubot, Robots were a moneymaker, and Nintendo knew that. If there was one thing that American kids would want, it would be a robot to play video games. And remember, interest in video games with consumers didn't really go anywhere. Arcades were still very popular. Again, the crash wasn't really caused by a lack of interest. It was bad business practice. Kids still wanted to play video games, but retailers wouldn't supply them, so they turned to arcades. Nintendo of Japan got to work making the perfect accessory that they could use to sneak their system onto retailer shelves and into the heart of the American youth. Nintendo's research and development team created their very own Trojan horse who went by the name of the Robot Operating Buddy. Or Rob. Despite some skepticism within the company, Nintendo's president knew that Rob needed to be in American stores. Hello? Yeah, that's fine with me. Alright, uh, I will see you later. Nintendo unveiled their new design to retailers, and it got even more attention than before. But retailers still weren't quite ready to gamble. So instead, Nintendo decided to take a gamble to show them. They set up a small warehouse in northern New Jersey and made all their consoles and advertisements, being sure to steer clear of the phrase video games and opting for entertainment system instead. They did a test release in New York to try to win over retailers. Nintendo went to several retailers and told them that they could stock and display their Nintendo Entertainment System for 90 days free of charge. When that 90 days was up, Nintendo would come and collect whatever wasn't sold. And with that, the ball was in the retailer's court to decide what to do. But the NES and its robot pal completely shocked all the stores and sold extremely well. Now the NES really only had two games that were actually compatible to play with Rob. And in most cases, it was actually just easier to play with another person or use your other hand to use the other controller than play with Rob. And reviewers did not pull their punches with Rob when they went to express that. But it didn't matter. The NES was in American homes, and there were plenty of great games like Super Mario Bros. that made the NES worth having. Nintendo even did consumer surveys, which proved to them that all the targeted demographics loved the console. In that same poll, they also found out that the number one reason that parents bought it was because their children asked for it. 
and the number one reason that kids asked for it was for Rob the Robot. In 1986, Nintendo did an additional test release in Los Angeles, and later that year it was announced that it was being released nationwide. In this nationwide release, Rob was dropped, and the Super Mario Brothers package that came with an extra controller and the Super Mario Brothers game was adopted instead. Mario, as we know, for the last 35 years has been the face of video games. It's unquestionable the amount of legwork that Mario's done for the video game industry, but that might not have been the case if it wasn't for Rob. Rob was the one that convinced millions of kids to beg their parents for an NES, and that's exactly what retailers needed to see at that time. By 1988, Nintendo had a complete grip on the video game market and completely changed the perception of video games. Nintendo, of course, has gone on to become one of the most well-known video game companies in the world. And now that the story of Rob has been told, we can put a bookmark in this chapter. I'd like to thank you for watching. If you want to hear more stories about the things that you love, like and subscribe. Let me know what you want to hear the history of in the comments, and I might make a video about it. And of course, remember to thank Rob the next time you're playing your favorite video game.